Dr. Patrick Malone is an MD as well as having a PhD in neuroscience. His research focused on computational cognitive neuroscience and AI applications in radiology. In 2020, he joined the investment team at North Pond Ventures, where he invests in early stage health tech and deep tech companies. Patrick put together a viral Twitter thread on his transition from medicine and research into venture capital. In 40 tweets, he detailed his high yield advice on networking, communication, and which skills are useful to develop. Essentially a Bible on some of the meta skills needed to have impact at scale in healthcare. In this episode, we discussed that thread, and I asked Patrick to expand on some of those meta skills, as well as discussing his thesis on the future of healthcare. I think this is a super, super valuable interview. I hope you enjoy. So I was talking to somebody, kind of a machine learning person that also had done an MD PhD, working on machine learning applications in, in healthcare, and just chatting about machine learning kind of product or machine learning engineering jobs in kind of health tech. And at the end of the conversation, just as a kind of offhanded comment, uh, the person I was talking to said, hey, you know, by the way, Venture capital, I don't know if you ever considered it, but for someone with your skill set, it's actually kind of an interesting uh, career path. And, and also, by the way, there's a new fund, North Pond Ventures, where I'm at now, that just opened up in, in Bethesda down the street from you. And I knew very little about venture. I mean, <laughs> I say this jokingly, but it's, it's actually kind of serious. The extent of what I knew about venture was what I saw in the show Silicon Valley. I don't know if you've seen Silicon Valley, but uh, it turns out in hindsight, it's actually pretty accurate, but that really was like all I knew of venture. I didn't really have a business or finance background or really interest. Um, but I just said, Hey, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll take a look. I looked at North Pond. I, I looked up one of our co-founding partners, Mike Rubin, who's an MD PhD as well. Um, and again, this was the real pivotal moment, just sent a cold reach out, uh, without too much thought, frankly, um, saying, you know, essentially I would love to chat, hear more about your career path. You know, by the way, this is my background, similar to you did an MD, PhD, critical piece turned out to be mentioning that my research was kind of machine learning focused because in hindsight, turned out North Palm was building a a kind of technology practice and looking for somebody with my type of backgrounds. But two days later, Mike uh, Mike Rubin responded, uh, fortunately, to the the cold reach out from a stranger. Uh, Two days later, we we had a conversation uh, about his career path. He kind of sold me on on venture capital and why it's a, just a fantastic place for someone uh, kind of like him and I with this more technical and, and scientific interest. I think a week after that, I started a, a fellowship or internship uh, during my last year of med school when I had some kind of extra time to spare and it just like immediately clicked. I, I think um, two weeks after that, I, I figured there's a decent shot. This is what I would end up doing uh, two weeks after that. So a month into it, they made a full-time offer and it was just an easy decision at, at that point for me personally to make the jump. So kept working at North Pond full time um, during the last year of medical school and then joined uh, full time after graduating a little over a year ago. But just to summarize, I think the main take home message for me, and I, I try to communicate this to anyone that'll, that'll listen, is that you know, it's, it's critically important to have you know, these five year and 10 year plans, not because you st- will stick to them, you probably won't. Um, I just see them as more important to having like a higher level logic or philosophy for how you spend your time. So you're not just wandering around totally aimlessly. But the reality is that serendipity governs everything in life. I mean, I, I really, truly think this, that, you know, life is essentially these series of, of seemingly insignificant events that have these massive downstream kind of life altering outcomes. Um, and for me, it was the same thing. So I think in, in certainly pre-medical education and medical school, there's a sense that, and there is this very tried and true path of going from A to B, from you know, pre-med to medical school, medical school to residency, residency to private practice. And it's very well trodden. Um, and as important, I think for many people, that's the right decision. But I think it's also important to not be too formulaic about it and keep an open mind to potential uh, points of serendipity. Yeah, my story is, is just one of many other people, very similar stories. Uh, but I think the take home message is you want to be uh, thoughtful about how you spend your time, how you craft your training, you know, what you want to do over the long term, but don't be necessarily overly wedded to it and be open to kind of other uh, other opportunities. Do you think from when you approached your friend at Google Health or when you um, approached uh, North Pond Ventures that you being in a position where you were curious about VC, but it wasn't necessarily you going to them and saying, give me a job, rather you being like, hey, I'm this great guy and uh, what you're doing looks interesting. Do you think that kind of flipped the psychology a bit and made you the one who was chased after rather than chasing? Do you think there's any truth in that? I I, I do to some degree. I mean, I think I put this, um, uh, when I kind of put this together in a Twitter thread, I, my advice is always ask for advice, not for a job. And, th- and this is kind of a play on, I forget who originally said this, but essentially saying ask for 
advice, not for money. Um, so if you're fundraising for, for a venture capital fund or if you're fundraising for your startup, you could certainly be in fundraising mode, but you could also reach out to people that you see as kind of respected and trusted parties and ask for their advice. And it's obvious you know, that they're thinking in the back of their minds, you know, maybe I would invest and they're trying to get to know you outside of the kind of you know, explicit conversation around fundraising. Um, so for me, I think it's a couple of things. One, it's important to reach out um, thoughtfully and ask for these kind of informational interviews, informal conversations, however you want to think about them for two reasons. Number one, people are more inclined to respond when it's not an explicit ask because they may or may not have a job. And the point is not for you to get a job right now. There could be an opportunity, say, a year down the line. You're just, you're just trying to kind of introduce yourself. But more importantly, I had no idea if I wanted to do venture capital, right? Like I was reaching out just because it seemed interesting. I was trying to explore all possible opportunities um, and just learn more. Um, if I had thought then, well, you know, venture capital, I, you know, I've seen Silicon Valley, it seems stupid and not for me. <laughs> so I just wouldn't have done it. So I, that's the point is I think it's important to not necessarily go in with these preconceived notions of what you may or may not want. Just go into it with kind of beginner's mind, open posture and, and learn more and then opportunities may you know may arise at the back end that you didn't anticipate have you heard about this i'm sure you have this explore exploit framework where early on you're in explore mode you have these meetings you reach out do the cold reach outs and then eventually you get into exploit mode do you do you buy into that i, I do i mean i'm a computer nerd so it all goes back to to ai right so this is a, a huge thing in reinforcement learning which is a, a big area of, of uh, machine learning these days you know deep mind and others have kind of pioneered this with AlphaGo. But yeah, there's 100% this idea of explore, exploit, trade-off. Um, and it's it, it very much, I don't want to overstate the importance of um, uh, exploring. I mean, you really have to like go into this mindset of, uh, you know, very much exploiting once you find something. So one thing that I oftentimes uh, give as advice for whether or not people should do an MD, PhD versus something else, one of the advantages is that it, it maintains optionality. So one piece of advice that I've, I've read and heard, which I... I think in some instances is right, is you want to make the decision that is going to open up the most doors or close the fewest doors, kind of maintain optionality. And I think for training in your 20s, that makes a lot of sense. But if you're constantly just exploring and never exploiting and just doing the path of least resistance that opens up the most uh, kind of doors to, uh, down the line, I mean, that's just a path for to that's just a path to nowhere. That's a path to, you know, infinite number of forks in the road. Um, so from my perspective, it's, it's important to maintain both. I, I oftentimes see people doing one or the other in my world and in, in medicine and in science it's very much more exploit like you know people may really despise clinical medicine but they stay the course anyway because they are overly optimized on exploit but yeah i think it's a super useful uh mental framework that i definitely use myself one thing i personally really struggle with with reaching out to people and being in that explore mode is that sometimes i feel like it's productive procrastination so it's a lot easier for me to go into linkedin find 10 people and contact them and ask them for advice than it is to actually go and do the thing that I want to do. And you've alluded to this a bit, but how do you balance, you know, between being, between exploring, reaching out to people and then just getting on with it and exploiting? Yeah, it's, it's another great point. I think um, ultimately advice is super contextual and very personal. Um, so you can't, I, I do think there's this tendency to over index on any one piece of advice, um, you know, reach out to a bunch of people because you're, 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 I don't know, procrastinating, you're indecisive, whatever the case may be. Um, I should say one, not, not you, uh, one may reach out to, to many people, uh, for that reason. But the key thing is that these are all just data points, right? Ultimately, um, just to use one example, the, the conversation I have a lot with folks is whether or not to do a residency after medical school. No one can answer this question for you. This is incredibly personal. I mean, this really is like, should I marry? this potential spouse or, or should I, you know, go this potential career path when that career path is something as, as difficult and as time consuming and, you know, emotionally draining that is medicine. It's important to talk to people. All of these things are data points. Um, but at some point you yourself have to make a decision, integrate all of those data points into a, uh, kind of a cohesive picture that makes sense to you. Um, but I agree. I mean, if you find yourself or if one finds themselves just having endless conversations, taking on advice from a bunch of people and, you know, your decision or whatever, however you're thinking about it is kind of indexed to whatever the last conversation was. I think then it's important just to kind of choose a path and, and kind of dive in head first at that point. I want to pick up on this Twitter thread that you posted, and I've got a note of about seven or eight points I want to discuss based off it. Um, but I thought we could start off by talking about your advice on building and maintaining a network of people. And I think... I think what you wrote is super interesting because a lot of these things are things that no one ever teaches you. 
And they're the kind of things that you want someone to literally sit down with you and say, do this, write this email, write it in this format, then put it in this database. You know, you want the the step-by-step handheld guide. And I think you've really done that with this Twitter thread. So to start with, can you talk about your advice on building and maintaining a network, both the high-level stuff, but also the granular, detail stuff as well? Yeah, no, for sure. And this it was actually a, a, a surprising um, and interesting uh, point of this Twitter thread. That was like one of the most, if not the most popular piece um, uh, or like tweet or, or point that I touched on there, which I thought was interesting. So I think it hits on, I think, a key question that people um, are curious about and want to learn more. Um, I'll definitely get into the to the granular, but I, I think one thing I want to emphasize, because uh, it, it definitely gets lost in, in that thread is that even before you think about the tactical stuff, the systems, uh, et cetera, for maintaining a network, the, the point which probably can be left unsaid, but I think it's important to emphasize, is that when building a network and just being out there in the ecosystem, it's super important not to be transactional. Like you should be genuine. You should be genuinely interested in people before you're trying to be interesting yourself. Um, you know, I think this is probably ingrained in me being from and growing up in the Midwest where people are just friendly by nature. It's just something I think that, that most folks in the, in the Midwest or in the United States uh, just grow up with culturally. And that's kind of something that I've just constantly, um, I guess, done by second nature, and, but I've also tried to prioritize. This is like, just be a good person, be a good human being, always try to be thinking about like what you can be due to helping in addition to um, you know, what others might be able to, to offer you. Um, and I think this is, is critical in kind of a, a relationship driven business like venture. Um, you know, this is one thing that I, I knew was important. Everyone knows that, you know, who, you know, is critical and relationships are important and all that kind of stuff. And especially in business and investing, that's true. But every day that goes by after two years of making this tr- transition, I'm just endlessly impressed by how true it is. Um, and I think your reputation is, is critical and the way you carry yourself in the ecosystem is super important. So always try to, to just be a good person, um, be genuine with folks and not transactional, try to help out where you can and try not to only reach out to folks when you need something. So that's point number one. Again, it's obvious. I'm sure most people realize it, but I think it's like the most critical piece. Forget all the maintaining the CRM systems and everything like that. Like this is the one thing you have to do right. Otherwise, none of that other stuff matters. Um, but beyond that, the, the more systematic stuff, I think for someone like me and for many folks coming from kind of the PhD world, it, it really does help because I'm, I personally, you know, at the risk of oversharing, I'm, I'm kind of like an intro for introvert, extrovert hybrid to some degree. I definitely skew the introvert, uh, uh kind of end of the spectrum. And so this type of stuff, I think helps me, um, just stay on top of something that I don't naturally gravitate to. I really do enjoy the relationship part of venture, the endless conversations of people you meet. I enjoy all of that, but I think having some systems in place really helps. So the way I do it is, is quite simple. Um, you know, a lot of folks ask what software I use. I don't think the software really matters. I use notion. It can be anything. It can be, you know, pen and paper, Excel, whatever. But the main point is just anytime you meet somebody, um, just writing down their name. I mean, there's certain people that you will just constantly talk to that you meet that you don't probably don't need to do this because you just immediately click, you vibe with them and you'll, you know, maintain a lifelong friendship. Uh, there's other folks that you may chat with a few times a year and, and this is where the system is helpful. So I, if I have one conversation that it's clear, um, that we have a lot to offer each other and that we're going to stay in touch, or maybe it's a couple conversations to get to this point, I write their name down. I tag uh, with whatever their interests or expertise or position is. So, you know, it could be a physician, could be scientist, could be radiology or neuro or payer if they work for a health plan. It could be anything, like something that's helpful for indexing what this person's all about, um, what they're interested in and, and what their expertise is. Location, I think, is also critical. Um, and this is one key lesson uh, I think is worth emphasizing in kind of this age of, of Zoom. Um, I think Zoom and remote work has been an incredible thing, especially for me, you know, building a life in the DC area, which is not a typical kind of health tech, health tech or biotech hub. It's helpful to kind of scale the interactions that, that one can have. But at the end of the day, and I, I strongly believe this, there's no substitute for in-person uh, interactions. And so I've always tried to build relationships in person and then maintain them remotely. Um, and this is where I think keeping uh, kind of a tag of where people are located is critical. So if I, you know, I make a trip to Boston or to the Bay area or wherever I can immediately see, okay, these are the people that I know in the area. These are the people I haven't talked to. in so in, in so long, and so I'll reach out and we'll grab a, a beer or a coffee or whatever. Um, so I think that's the, the second most important piece. And then the last piece, which I really like is just having like a date. Um, and you can do this, you know, uh, formulaically in Excel or notion, 
having a date, which is the last time you interacted with that person. And then it will automatically uh, flag whenever it's been three months, six months, a year, however long you want it to be to let you know, like, hey, you haven't chatted with this person in so long, time to reach out. Um, and again, going back to, to making this not transactional, I, I if I talk to somebody that I know is interested in, say, um, obesity research, for example, um, I may see like last week or two weeks ago, I saw a New England Journal of Medicine paper about a new uh, obesity drug, which showed really drastic, impressive results. I immediately think of them because I remember that they're, this is what their PhD was in. They're now a, a faculty uh, working on this particular area. You know, they probably have seen it, but I just sent it to them in case they haven't. So the point is like, don't only reach out like when you need something or when it's like, quote unquote, time to reach out. It's a good reminder too, if you haven't, but like, this is one important thing is just like reach out when just you see something that's relevant to this person, or maybe you have invested in a company where you sit on the board of that's hiring for a position that would, they would be great for that they may be interested in. Like it's always this give, give and take that I think is is really critical to keep in mind when, when building these, uh, these networks and relationships. I roughly do what you've suggested, but it's much more uh, primitive. It's on Apple Notes. Um, but one thing I felt a bit uncomfortable or a bit cheap about doing is I have a memory of a goldfish. So if I meet someone and they mention some small detail, like they got a new pet or, you know, their kids or something like that, I've found myself at times writing that down in my system. And then next time I speak to them, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that point. But then to me, that feels a bit cheap and a, I don't know, just a bit disingenuous. Like what, what are your thoughts on that? Like whole criticism of this, that it's just a bit, there's something artificial about it. Yeah, I think it's fair criticism. I, you know, I, I don't see humans as, uh, you know, the, the fact that humans have shitty memories is not a function of like being disingenuous or, or not like genuinely interested in people. That's kind of the way I think about it. So I 100% this is actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I think this is another key piece um, for so much for, for both for networks and relationship building, but just for so much of what is investing. Um, note taking is is really critical. It's it's probably the most critical because I'm by no means a super memorizer uh, like some other folks. Uh, so for me, and again, the software doesn't really matter. But one thing that I've really liked over the last couple of years is uh, something called Obsidian. Um, Rome Research is another one. There's like all these kind of like network uh, based. I'm not sure what the exact name is for them, but they're kind of these note taking systems where it's very much a flat hierarchy. So you're not writing a note and thinking about where you might tag it or file it away. And you just start writing a note and you just connect it to other topics or other notes. And it's very similar to the way our actual human memory works uh, in terms of the neuroscience. So I just find it just very much vibes with the way my brain works. But the point here is just every time I take so many calls in venture, pitch calls, follow-up calls, ecosystem calls, you're never going to remember, no matter how genuinely interested you in you are in, in what people are working on or what their backgrounds are, you're never going to remember all of it. And so one thing that's super helpful is just like actually keeping these notes so I know what we discussed previously. And then when I actually have a new conversation, say, you know, you and I catch up six months from now, I can bring up the note while taking notes on the, the current note, bring up the note from our previous conversation. And remember that, you know, you would ask something that I was supposed to follow up on or you mentioned something that I wanted to follow up on. It just is super seamless in, in that way. And I think increasingly... Not to get too too nerdy about it, but as we augmented reality uh, kind of continue uh, continues to be adopted, uh, you know, Apple's working on this, Facebook obviously is working on this. I think this is the next iteration of kind of general computing. Um, I think it's going to be a, an increasingly common thing that you know, anytime you could imagine a future where you may be wearing a pair of, of glasses that have this augmented reality interface, and you know, it automatically recognizes your face and pulls up our previous notes so that you can Im immediately remember that we had discussed. Um, you know, X, Y, and Z. I can see that I can certainly see the um, kind of dystopian view here that this just boils all this stuff down to computer code and, and, and transactional. But I think there's an optimistic view as well, where I think this just only kind of augments uh, kind of our existing um, relationships and, and uh, kind of social interactions. So that's kind of how I think about it. There's this really interesting Gary V book, and I think it's called something like Jab, 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 Punch. And the... <laughs> whole idea of the book is that when you are in his case marketing or running a business when you're speaking to your audience or speaking to your customers you should do so in a way that you're almost giving them giving them giving them stuff so free content or free value and only every maybe one in ten times should you actually take value off them so uh, that might be for example giving them free 10 sets of free content and then on the 10th time you might ask for something back or ask them to do something. And 
This is something I struggle with in network building, which is, you know, you mentioned that you shouldn't only reach out to people when you need something off them, which I think totally makes sense. But there's a part of me that struggles to know when I'm giving value and when I'm taking value. So one example might be if I introduce someone to someone else, it's not always clear to me whether that introduction is something that they want or that's something that is like a time sink for them or that is something that is actually giving them value. And I just wanted to ask more broadly, how do you think about this give take framework? Like how often should you be catching up with someone to deliver them value and how often should you be maybe making an ask of them? Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think I hadn't, I've not read the Gary V book, but I think it's a really interesting idea. The way I think about it or the way I immediately contextualize it in my mind is that this give and take whole, this whole give and take trade-off presupposes that we as humans understand what we want. I think a very minority of the time we actually understand what we want in the moment or, or certainly can predict. I think more importantly, very, very little of the time can we, or very rarely can we predict in the future what's going to be relevant to what we need or want or, or whatever. And so for me, if you have to be like uh, utilitarian about it, I think the right way to think about it is like, I have a bunch to offer, like just, you know, everyone's got to answer this personally. But for me, for example, and this has just been true, say over the last two months because of the Twitter thread, I have a unique experience having come from medicine and now doing a different career. Making that transition is incredibly difficult because there's very few resources when in academia, when in medicine to think about alternative career paths. And it's a tremendous amount of time. The, re and the funny thing about this Twitter thread is I, I wrote this as a way to like potentially decrease the number of one-on-one -on -one conversations I would have with people looking for advice, and, but it's completely backfired. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm kind of joking, but like I'm happy to do it because number one, like I wish more of these resources and more folks in, in my position when I was in that position would have been able to have these conversations and share the things I've learned because there are definitely things I would have done the same or differently. Um, and so I think just like thinking about what you have to offer and just really getting out in the world and, and, and distributing whatever that skill, knowledge, however you think about it is. And then at some point in the future, like you may, if you need to, again, need to be um, selfish about it, at some point in the future, there will be something that either you can, again, offer that person or that person will offer you. You may not be able to predict what that might be because, again, who knows what we're all doing in five years. It's probably not what we think we'll be doing in five years. And whatever that new opportunity is that we can't predict is going to require its own kind of sets of, of, of needs and, and people in your network, et cetera. Um, so a long way of saying that I, I think just the default posture is always just like, what can I offer is kind of the way I think about it. That's the best way to ultimately get what you want, but it's also the best way to kind of like bootstrap this whole ecosystem that we all operate in, operate into kind of like a positive sum uh, world in a view, in a way. In the thread as well, you wrote that three key assets for anyone in this space were communication skills, domain expertise, and a network. And I just wanted to ask you to riff off that and talk about any um, high yield advice for developing any three of those. Let's start with domain expertise. I think domain expertise is key. Um, and the way I think about it, and again, caveat being that I'm obviously colored by my experience, you know, my reality is an N of one, so can't really overgeneralize too much. But I think there's a sense of like, okay, I've had a number of follow-up conversations with folks that are early in their PhD and they're trying to, to pick a, a PhD lab. Um, and they say, well, you know, what, what's hot in venture right now? You know, in the latest biotech uh, wave of companies, what area is most interesting? Is it, is it CRISPR? Um, is it RNA editing? Is it, you know, some, is it field X, like what's hot? And, and therefore I want to do my PhD in it. And that way, you know, in five years, uh, when I come out of my PhD, I'm going to be most sought after by these biotech companies. You know, my, my position, uh, is that that's a bit of a dangerous way to think about it for a couple of reasons. One, who knows what's going to be hot in five years. It's hard to predict. Uh, but more importantly, I think the, the most important thing is you want to do more than like you actually getting specific skills that you think are going to be specifically applicable to what you do in the future. And obviously, by the way, if, if you plan to go the you know academic scientist route and build a lab and, and chase NIH grants and all that kind of stuff, none of this advice applies. Maybe it does to some degree, but I don't mean for that advice to be applied to those situations. Let's say you know you want to go into biotech or into venture. My position is that really what you want to do is you just want to do cool stuff. Like you would just want to research and work on projects that are interesting because they're interesting and nothing more. Um, you certainly want the, them to result in skills that are uh, transferable and applicable. So for me, even though my project had, from my perspective, zero real world applications, like I was not going to build this sensory substitution device into a company. That was never the goal. 
I wasn't doing it because I thought I was going to go invest in companies that do something similar because there actually are some companies, but very few. The point was, number one, it was cool. Like it's something that I can talk about to you know people that know nothing about neuroscience and they find it kind of interesting. Um, it gives me a story that's like interesting and memorable to people that I meet in the ecosystem. But most importantly, I, it was something that I love to wake up every day and, and think about and read about and research. And I built a bunch of skills, programming, machine learning, et cetera, for the project that were ultimately going to be relevant to maybe a different area of research that I went to work on or ultimately in venture where I invest in a bunch of kind of machine learning enabled companies. Um, but the point is when you're developing domain expertise, it's not even really about the specific domain. It's just about developing a name for yourself and something. Um, and that something will result in generalizable skills, you know, critical thinking, scientific mind, all that kind of stuff is applicable no matter what specifically you research. Um, but most importantly, it's about like developing a name and, and story and narrative for yourself that will help you do whatever you want in the future. The last thing I'll say, and this is kind of guided how I've thought about crafting my particular uh, kind of training trajectory is look at the intersections of fields um, that may not at face value have anything to do with each other. I, I think some of the most interesting domain expertise you can craft for yourself is a totally new domain taking two different areas. For me, it was machine learning and medicine, which is not super novel. There's many people pursuing this intersection now. Um, it can be something more interesting or the same. But take two different areas that where you can be like, you know, I personally was never going to be a, a 10x Google engineer, a top 1% machine learning practitioner, but I could be above average and then combine that with, you know, an above average skill set in clinical medicine. And all of a sudden you're doing something that no one else can. And so that's another way to think about it is find like areas of science or areas of, of science in some other field like medicine, combine different skill sets uh, and uh, kind of fields of inquiry into a new field, a new domain. And now all of a sudden you've kind of set yourself apart uh, in that way. Um, so that's domain expertise, I think is, is really important. Um, writing skills, I mean, this, this one is, is critical and, and more broadly communication skills. A few things that I think are, are, are relevant here. One, just writing early. Um, so there's a sense, I constantly hear people say this, like, well, you know, I, I don't really have anything to write about. So I'm just going to wait until some epiphany strikes and I all of a sudden have an idea to write. That's not the way to think about it, in my opinion. Um, and this is other people have said this, said this, this is not my idea. Um, but you don't write, uh, you don't write what you think you write to discover what you think, meaning the number of times I would say this most often happens where I sit down to write something, an idea that I think I have. And as soon as I start writing it, I realize that there's like three holes in my logic. And actually, I think something different. And like, I wouldn't have discovered that until you actually put pen to paper and actually like scale your mind in that way uh, to actually understand what you actually think about something. And, and just scientifically for folks that are that may be listening that are PhD students, you may have this uh, experience. And if you don't, you should, uh, where there's a sense in science that you should complete the entire experiment, complete the entire project, and then write it up. Um, in my opinion, that, that's backwards. You should be writing at the very beginning, uh, whether it's the methods section, whether it's the introduction that sets up the justification and rationale for the experiment, start writing early. Because you and I had this experience uh, in undergrad and I, I changed it for my PhD. Once you start writing up the manuscript, you realize there's like three errors in how you've been thinking about stuff. Um, and this is something that's generalizable beyond science. So I think writing early before you think you're quote unquote done with the project is critical because it's going to change how you actually do the project and save you a bunch of time in the long run. Um, last things that's that's point number one i think point number two about communicating which i think is like if you're looking to practice communication this is the easiest thing because it doesn't require having a blog it doesn't require having a podcast it requires none of those things just spend time actually proofreading and modifying and editing the stuff that you send every day in emails in texts in slacks like a number of times i would say this is and i'm guilty of this too i'm, I'm not you know casting stones here you just fire off an email that's like three paragraphs long you write it in five minutes you do not proofread it you don't read through it again you just send it off um it, the number of times i actually have stopped myself and gone back and basically decreased the number of words by half at least and made it more clear uh what i was trying to communicate just with like five extra minutes of work. Number one, it saves time for the person on the other end uh, of that conversation, not having to read through a bunch of confusing uh, uh, language. But more importantly, that that is what you're trying to practice, right? You're trying to communicate complex ideas, distill it to its fundamentals, efficiently and effectively communicate it, do it in fewer words. All of those things you can practice every single day in the emails you send your coworkers, in the texts you send your friends and family, um, 
that's, I think, probably one of the most high yield things you can do. Because again, everybody is, uh, you may not be writing a blog, but you're definitely, you know, writing texts and, and emails. Um, so that's a, one key thing on, on writing that I think is important to, to try out. There's a really good quote from, I think it's Oscar Wilde, where it's something like, sorry, I wrote you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one, which so I think good. is so accurate. It's so good. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's, I'm glad you reminded me of that one. That, that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic point. That's, that's the reason why it, it, it's hard to write succinctly. It takes time. Um, and so, you know, you're not always going to have uh, those opportunities. You're not always going to have the time to do it, but I think it's, it's critical to practice it when you can. There's a theme from your Twitter thread and general advice, which I don't think you explicitly mentioned, but I think it's happening uh, underneath the layers, which is this whole concept of not only putting out content, but also building your personal brand in the space. And I wanted to ask for you as someone, as a, as a VC, but also just as someone who's trying to make change in an area, how are you going about personal branding and content production? Is that something you're actively thinking about? Are you just letting it organically happen? Are there any thoughts you have there? Yeah, it's, it's something I haven't been super intentional about until the last few months. And I, I've been on Twitter for a long time, but I've, I've only been most active on Twitter over the last few months. So I'm, I'm trying to be a bit more thoughtful about it. There's kind of two things and I'll, and I'll broaden or maybe I'll be a little more specific about personal brand and just say writing content or communicating content online, um, which indirectly builds brand. I, th I think for me, there's there's two motivations. And by the way, there's probably many folks out there that just like me uh, cringe when they hear personal brand and I have them the same way. But the reality is it is important and it actually can have beneficial uh, effects for both you know your oneself, but also for society, humanity, however you want to think about it. So I, I think it actually is an important thing despite having some maybe some negative uh, connotations. For me, it's two reasons. One, to my earlier point about discover, writing to discover what you think. So much of what I do in venture is looking at new industries, new markets, new technologies where I know may know very little. So trying to learn, but also come to a point of view about where the future of X is going and what my thesis is in that space. And so one way I do that is through conversations with you know, people that I kind of like intellectually vibe with. But the second is is writing. Um, so that's like a, a key piece. It's just writing to figure out what I actually think about something and doing it publicly is great. One, because you're actually soliciting feedback from people that are smarter and know more than, than I do, but also you're indirectly promoting your brand. People know that you're thinking about this kind of stuff, uh, et cetera. The second piece, and, and this is, I admit, this is specific to venture. Um, I, it's not as relevant to say science, although it can be. Um, I'll just say this specific to, to venture capital and early stage startup investing. Um, but again, I think this is probably relevant to other industries as well. So much of what we do is occupying, is enabled by occupying mindshare. Um, so for example, the very earliest stage investing, um, it's very much about access. Uh, it can be about picking to some degree, meaning how well you can pick the startup that you think is going to win five years down the line. But a lot of times it's about access. Like we know that you know, there's some really capable, talented founder coming out of some top academic lab, and everybody wants to invest in that person, but they may not know that they're actually spinning something up. So there it's about actually having the relationships so that you know that this person is building the company, that thing will be funded before it ever gets announced. And so the point is, like, it's very relationship driven. There's many ways to, to build those relationships. One is obviously to be out in the ecosystem, which everyone should be doing, one-on-one -on -one conversations, et cetera, et cetera. But the other most scalable way is to actually be communicating your ideas, your theses, your value add publicly. Um, and just you know, the fact that you write, uh, whether it's a you know, sub stack post or a Twitter thread or you have a podcast, just getting your brand, your identity, your ideas out there so that it occupies mindshare of people that may be building these companies, it helps them find you in addition to you finding them. So I may have some thesis on what the future of machine learning and healthcare looks like. Uh, and there's some founder out there that I'd never met that has a similar idea and they're looking for somebody that to invest in this. And they're like, Hey, oh, by the way, I don't, I don't know this guy, but I saw him write this piece that very much vibes the way I, I think about the world. I should get connected with them. So those are the two reasons that kind of motivate some of the stuff I've been trying to do more of, um, which kind of motivates a lot of the uh, increased activity on, on Twitter, et cetera, on my part. There was a bit of advice in the thread, which seems to run counter to a lot of what you've been saying, which was about when you're at med school or grad school, it was just don't get too distracted with extracurriculars, which, you know, can run contrary to a lot of this stuff. So what's the balance there? Yeah, I mean, that, that that's something that I, you're right to point out uh, that definitely um, uh, is, is contrary to a lot of what I'm saying. And this is the tricky part, and I'm by no means good at this. 
saying no, balancing one's time. Everyone struggles with this. I 100% struggle with this. There's always this this trade off early in one's career where you uh, want to, and in many instances, sh should say yes to a lot of stuff. Um, and then there's a switch that you need to flip where you need to start being more and more thoughtful about how you spend your time. But you certainly can't. I'm always skeptical to some degree of people saying, like, say no, say no. You should be saying no to everything. Like, if I said no to everything from the beginning of my career, I'd be nowhere. And I think most people are probably that way. But again, it's a super tight balance to strike. So it's tricky. I think. The first couple years of your PhD, and again, I, I'm, I hesitate to overgeneralize this too much, but the way I thought about it is the first couple years of your PhD, the first year of the PhD or the first year of medical school, there's a baseline foundational knowledge that you're acquiring. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty. This is one mistake that I made where I was just so focused on what I thought I wanted to do. Anything that wasn't related to that, um, to that topic. Uh, so for example, you know, machine learning uh, in neuroscience applied to sensory processing. Like I was laser focused on that and then taking it back to medicine once I go back to medical school. Embryology, neurodevelopment, all these other areas, I just completely ignored. I did, I did the bare minimum to, to get by in class. In hindsight, I kind of regret that because a lot of that knowledge is actually, at the end of the day, I have a PhD in neuroscience. I should know that stuff. It's actually relevant to a lot of the stuff that I do in venture. Eight years ago, or whenever it was, six, five years ago during my PhD, I had no idea. I barely knew what venture capital was, right? So, like, I had no idea this is what I was going to be doing. And so, this is why I hesitate about being too, like, thinking you know what you want and ignoring everything else. It's a bit tricky. Um, so, for me, that's one thing I would have done differently. So, that's why I think not being too oversubscribed at the earlier stages of your MD or PhD is important because you're there to learn some foundational knowledge. You're there first and foremost to figure out, do I want to do residency? Do I want to do a postdoc? And so if you're too oversubscribed, if you're too distracted, you're not going to get the full immersion required to actually answer that question. And you're not going to get all of the skills that you need uh, in order to, to move beyond um, you know, graduation to a residency or postdoc. But it's tricky. I mean, I, I totally grant that VC is hard to get into, and therefore these VC fellowships, which I think are fantastic opportunities, are great ways to, to kind of gain that exposure and potentially find a, a full uh, a full time position. Um, there's a bunch of other things that you can do early in medical school and graduate school that help you like sample the space of other things that are out there. So yeah, I, I probably overstated it in the you know 140 characters, whatever it was on on Twitter. Um, I think it's like it's it's pretty context dependent. I just think it's it's important to be very thoughtful about how you spend your time in your PhD and MD and have a high bar for other activities that you might take on. Not to say that you should never do it, but it shouldn't be something where it's like, oh, you know, it takes 10 hours a week. You know, it may or may not be a waste of time. Let's just try it. It should be something that you're quite thoughtful about uh, engaging at the earliest stages of your of your training. I want to ask a little bit about your thesis on the future of healthcare, maybe your own personal thesis on all of this. And I'd be particularly interested in any unusual or contrarian or weird beliefs or predictions you have about the future of healthcare. Is there anything there? There's a bunch of ways I could answer that. I think, and this will actually be the, probably the less juicy take, and I have a, a bunch of interesting takes on the future of, of healthcare that you know most of which will probably be wrong, but they're nonetheless interesting. But I think one, there's one in particular that I think is like really instructive in the kind of vein of, of conversation we've had on all these other pieces. Um, and let's just say so broad as to be machine learning and healthcare and how my thesis, uh, investment thesis in the space has kind of changed as I came from like a more technical background to a much more kind of business and finance minded investor at this point over the last two years. I think it's, it's helpful to illustrate one, how somebody with a similar background to mine should think about kind of adapting their mental models to investing, but two, how I see the future of, of kind of machine learning and healthcare playing out. So right before I moved to, to venture, I was doing radiology AI research. So trying to develop novel convolutional neural networks for the detection of various things on chest X-ray, for example, and thinking through some methodological choices to result in essentially the most generalizable model across sites, across scanners, uh, across demographics, that kind of stuff. Super important work to kind of like the technical feasibility of of uh, machine learning and radiology. I moved to venture and naively thought, okay, you know, investing, it's, it's this simple. I'm going to find the radiology AI company with the best algorithm, with the most differentiated training data set of highest quality, with the highest AUC sensitivity, specificity, best general, generalization parameters, et cetera. Like I, I was thinking about it from a technical perspective. I'm going to diligence the algorithm. Um, and it's so much more than that. I would argue, and this is like, I wouldn't say this is necessarily contrarian, but I do think there's still a sense uh, 
in the healthcare AI space that the reason why we do not have widely deployed healthcare AI, like the reason why if you know I uh, fell and hit my head most of the time when I go to the hospital, I'm not going to have uh, some product like this AI's uh, large vessel occlusion. Well, this is more for stroke, but you get my point. The reason why I go to a hospital and I'm not actually getting an algorithm that's detecting uh, some pathology on my medical imaging scans, it's not a technical question. Not to overstate the fact that like it's it's important for us to continue to push the boundaries on generalizability of these algorithms. I think bias in medical imaging is still an important, important problem. There's lots of technical challenges that I think are important to continue to work on. But I would argue that we have the technical capabilities sufficient to actually derive clinical utility from these algorithms. And the point is, we're not doing that at scale yet. So the question is, why is that? Two years ago, I would have thought it was a technical challenge. Well, if we just eke out a few more uh, percentage points of AUC, then of course, you know, the era of machine learning and healthcare would be upon us. It's much more than that. So it's a few things. Number one, there really hasn't been a business model, a venture scalable business model to support these startups. Um, it's made it quite challenging. And there's been a number of success stories. I don't mean to say I'm still long-term bullish on this space, uh, but in the lack of reimbursement, there's only a few reimbursement codes uh, at the moment for a few different algorithms and companies, certainly not uh, widely scalable. It's gonna help support this uh, ecosystem yet. So there's a lack of business model to actually support the perpetuation of these companies, the layering on of additional capabilities and product development, et cetera. Really the whole uh, kind of business case that actually allows these companies to scale and grow and, and continue to deploy machine learning and healthcare. The second piece is, is clinical adoption has been really challenged. Uh, if you've ever seen a radiologist practice medicine, they're, they're operating at absolute peak efficiency. So even the tiniest of friction introduced into their workflow via, say, a clinical decision support algorithm that helps them decide whether there's pneumonia on chest X-ray, even just a little bit of friction is going to uh, basically doom that thing from being used because, again, clinical adoption is a very finicky thing. Um, and the ROI, sadly, in healthcare, oftentimes increased patient outcomes or better patient outcomes is sometimes insufficient as a ROI for driving adoption of these things. It's the sad reality of, of medicine. Um, finally, I think there's not enough, and this is something that I'm critically interested in, less from the investing side, although I hope some companies get built in this space. I think an under-researched area is actually interaction between algorithms and physicians. So there's a sense that like algorithm plus physician is always going to be better than either in isolation. People always ask like, well, okay, is a radiology algorithm super physician in terms of performance? Um, well, the reality is if you actually look at these papers, oftentimes the comparison is algorithm compared to radiologist compared to radiologist, radiologist plus algorithm. And oftentimes the combined ensemble approach outperforms either in isolation. But the critical thing is that basically ignores a lot of the details around how do you actually incorporate an AI prediction into the workflow of the physician? So this is an example. There's a bunch of great research in this space. Again, I think it's under-researched, but there are people working on it. It's a paper in Nature Digital Medicine, I believe, uh, last year. Uh, that basically looked at how do you actually bias or not a physician when you deliver an AI prediction for uh, a chest X-ray read. Um, so basically, the, the way the experiment worked is they delivered a positive or negative read from the AI to the uh, physician and said, this chest X-ray is normal or this chest X-ray has pneumonia. And then the radiologist, or in this case, I think it was an emergency medicine physician, will give their read. Importantly, what they did was they actually gave the wrong feedback from the AI. So they were looking to see if they could actually bias, like would the radiologist or the physician know that the AI was wrong and stick with their prediction, or would they actually change their um, prediction, the physician? And what they found was they could actually bias the physician to below chance accuracy with incorrect uh, feedback from the AI, meaning that like their physician read was basically worse than a coin flip on whether or not you had pathology on chest X-ray when you had this erroneous AI making predictions. So the point is like, it's not as simple as just delivering a uh, AI read on top of the clinician workflow and the clinician integrates that as a data point and comes to their own decision. There's lots of cognitive biases. Um, you know, folks have read any of Danny Kahneman's work, you know how much of this stuff is really difficult to overcome as kind of a, a human decision maker. Um, so it's kind of a long uh, tangent, but the, the main point is that I came into medicine thinking that this was a technical challenge. And as we built better AI, we would have more venture scalable, successful companies and more and more patients would have AI in their kind of uh, patient care and clinical workflows. When in reality, those technical challenges are important and we continue to make progress there, but it's so much more. It's the idiosyncrasies of human computer interaction. It's the business model and lack of reimbursement. 
It's the payer perspective, like how this stuff will actually transition from fee for service to a value based care paradigm where we ultimately benefit patient, patient outcomes while also keeping costs low. Um, so that's a lot of like the transition that I've made over the last two years where I focus a lot of my time now is understanding that we invest in businesses, not technologies. The technology is necessary, but not sufficient, but it's ultimately the business that really uh, the business case and the revenue generated by the business that enables all of these flywheels to get going that these, these companies can actually grow. Um, so that's a bit of the trajectory of, of kind of my thesis in, in healthcare AI and, and how it's changed over the last two years as a result of being on the, on the venture side. You know, there's this whole concept of value investing. And from my really basic understanding of it, it's essentially that we can solve some of society's big problems using capitalism, companies, CEOs, those sorts of people can tackle some of the big problems. I mean, again, this is from very limited understanding on my part, but do you find that being in the US and investing in all of these amazing companies that are solving all of these big problems, do you find sometimes just thinking like the the whole healthcare system of the US is so um, non-optimal that you think, man, like this really like, we're, 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 you know, we're like, we're patching up holes in a, in a sinking ship here. There's there's a lot of big, bigger upstream st- stuff we could be doing. And I mean, you're in DC as well. So maybe you're in the right place to do some of that. But do you have that frustration? Yeah, every single day. Um, it's incredible. I mean, and you're in the UK, the UK, yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, NHS lean. You know, and I'm not, I don't have direct experience with it, so I'm I'm a, a little bit speaking out of my lane here. But but certainly compared to the US in terms of organizational structure, uh, incentive structures, it's just radically radically simpler. And every day, I mean, there's portfolio companies that that I work with. So we are very active capital at North Pond. So I, I make investments, but then we also, I take board seats. I work with these companies very actively, helping them think through strategic decisions, product development, uh, business models, all that kind of stuff. And there's a couple of companies that I work with that are uh, value-based care oriented. So transitioning from fee-for-service, meaning collecting revenue according to utilization by physicians to a value-based care paradigm where a company will get explicit amount of capital and they use that to take care of patients. And then sometimes they keep the difference as revenue. So there's this incentive to like, obviously take good care of patients, but also to do it in a cost effective way. But as I, I, I get more into the weeds and helping this company think through that uh, and learn more about, uh, you know, payer organization, how payers think all of the, you know, how the reimbursement structure works, how things go from fee for service to value-based care and what the physician incentives are, where physicians are often incentivized to take care of patients and to bill and not really to do it in a cost-effective way. It's incredibly, incredibly complicated. Um, I think over the last couple of years, that it'll be a really critical experiment that we've been running because everyone is probably aware of the amount of venture money that's gone into, you know, quote unquote, digital health or health tech or, you know, pick your buzzword. Um, but the reality is there's, there's been a bunch of companies spun up in the space with super talented management teams that are working on big problems and they're doing it. They're not going in saying we're going to, you know, completely gut the American healthcare system and, and build it from scratch. They're working within the existing ecosystem. Um, and I think they'll succeed. Um, certainly if we were starting over idealistically, obviously, I think we'd probably build it in a different way. And I don't claim to have the right answer, by the way, I, I don't know what the right answer is. It's incredibly difficult, but I know it's not this one. If again, if we were in an idealistic world, building it from scratch, um, but the point is, we're doing the best that we can. Everybody has the best of intentions. I don't think there are any real bad actors in this space. It's just healthcare is incredibly complicated. We made the best decisions we could over the course of many decades. And now we have a system that is a little bit kind of discombobulated. But I do think there's the very real chance for innovation here. These companies are working within the system that exists where it's really difficult to figure out like how you actually align incentives when there's oftentimes like stakeholders like employers and payers and patients and physicians, and, and all of them may have a different set of priorities and incentives. But there are companies working on this. I'm long-term bullish on the space. Yeah, if we could, in a perfect world, if we could do it over again, we might've done it differently. But I still think that there's going to be the opportunity for a lot of success and impact, uh, despite the challenges that, that we kind of all are aware of. Is there anything that we've not spoken about on the topic of career advice and these sorts of things that's been helpful for you that you think is worth mentioning? Is there is there anything else? Yeah, maybe two things. And, and sorry, these are going to be a bit disjointed, but I think these are two of the most important lessons that I think I've tried to channel um, and I think can really help uh, other folks. I just want to kind of underline them. One is, I think radical self-awareness is, is critical. And just to use, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to focus, focus this really on, on me, but I think 
personal stories oftentimes kind of drives this this point home. Um, I think really being honest with oneself about what your skills are, what one's weaknesses are, uh, what your interests are. Like the most ideal scenario is everyone talks about follow your passion. You want to figure out what you're passionate about and do that. And I think that's important advice. And, and ultimately, the ideal scenario is that what you're passionate about, like what you could do for hours on end every single day and not think of it as work, ultimately that would be, should be, and hopefully is the thing that you're best at, the thing that you're top 10%, 1% on. For me, it actually, interestingly, wasn't the case. So the thing that I was most interested in was coding, computer programming. Like if I, if I could pick the thing that I would be the best in the world at, it would probably be either software engineering or uh, kind of machine learning engineering, something like that. Like it's the it's one of the activities, like kind of like snow skiing or water skiing for me. Like I could literally just do it for twelve hours, be uninterrupted, and just have like hyper focus in that way. But the reality was, and this was the radical transparency, I kind of realized and then you know kind of quickly accepted that I was never going to be like a Jan LeCun or a Joshua Bengio or I'm, you know I'm, I'm naming kind of the Godfathers of AI. Like I was nowhere near that smart. I was nowhere near that level of talent. Um, it just wasn't the case and not saying that you need to be that in order to pursue a specific area. But for me, I always wanted to do something just thinking about my broader impact in the world. I wanted to find the thing that I was most uniquely suited to do that I liked. And I wanted to do that. And I don't think I was uniquely suited to be sitting behind a computer and, uh, kind of programming, building machine learning models, all this kind of stuff, even though that would have been the most fun in my opinion. Again, I know it's super dirty, but that's the truth. Um, and so I think just having like radical self-awareness in this way and just like transparency about what you're good at, what you like, um, what you are passionate about and like what your priorities are is really key. Because I think oftentimes there's this thing that people want to be and then there's the things that they should be. And they're oftentimes not overlapping. And a lot of times you'll, 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 you'll think of yourself as one thing because you want to think of yourself in that way. And it really isn't true. Um, and this is a, a, a very personal thing, but I think it's an important thing to keep in mind. I think um, uh, I think Richard Feynman was the one that uh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher the quote, but the idea was from for Richard Feynman, you know, the lies that we tell others pale in comparison to the lies we tell ourselves. And I, and I think that's a super important point that just to be really honest with yourself. Um, the second piece I think is um, is leading with action, um, and this has definitely got me in trouble at, at some points in life. But I think asking for forgiveness and not for permission within reason is the way to go. Um, so much of life, I think this is true in research. It's definitely true in venture. Um, you want to find a place where you're going to have mentors and people that are going to help you. But at the end of the day, no one's going to look out for you except for you. And nobody's going to tell you what to do most of the time. And so you have to lead with action. You have to try and figure out what makes sense to you, even if you don't think of yourself. And oftentimes you aren't an expert in that space. So don't overstep. Don't do stuff that's going to you know, be totally out of your lane. Uh, there are certain points where you should be asking for permission. But the point is, I think the people that do best in life are the people that are totally comfortable with uncertainty. They lead with action. They have like a, they think in solutions and not in problems. And not that the solutions are always right. In fact, they oftentimes aren't. But you're just always thinking with that like one foot forward attitude. And I think for me, that's something that I've always tried to do. And again, I, I certainly have, have overstepped and stepped on landmines here and there. It's, it's, it's comes with the territory of having this kind of posture. But I think in many areas of life, venture especially, this is just absolutely critical. So I would really encourage people to kind of get out of your comfort zone, lead with action, think in solutions, um, be thoughtful about it. But I think that's one of the most critical kind of more meta philosophical skills that are that are important in this space have there been any books or other kinds of resources that have been particularly helpful for you or that come to mind as things that have been yeah very useful yeah i guess it's let me pull up um i thought you might ask this so i had my, my kindle app open i mean so much of this is going to be dependent on what you ultimately do like there's certain books like for venture um and these may be a little bit too specific for um you know the scope of this podcast but Regardless, for venture, Power Law just came out as a really good book about the history of venture. I think if you're interested in kind of how venture capitalists think, the historical perspective on the space, you know, where we've come from, where we're going, that's a, a fantastic book. Um, there's also more kind of uh, tangible look, tangible books called um, The Business of Venture Capital and Venture Deals are kind of two standard, uh, standardly suggested readings for folks interested in venture. Um, other random books, and, and these are probably less, uh, you know, immediately immediately actionable, but have just really helped form the way my mind works. Um, one is the structure of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. 
um, really drives home the point that it was a sense that science is this very objective discipline, um, which is true to some degree, but the reality is science is, is practiced by scientists who are still humans subjective to biases and, and herd psychology and all that kind of stuff. So it, the way, what uh, Kuhn's book does is basically walks through the history of science and shows how we have, this is actually where the, the term paradigm shift, which is um, kind of common and vernacular at this point, but it actually, the word paradigm and paradigm shift actually originates from this book. And it has a very specific uh, definition in that you have this kind of cycle in science where there's some dogma that's accepted by all of science. You have some findings that don't quite make sense in the context of that dogma, which oftentimes get kind of um, uh, suppressed or dismissed by people that are you know, the big names in the field. But that happens over 10 years. You have more and more inconsistent findings that starts to overthrow uh, some of the existing dogma. And then you have this paradigm shift to the next dogma. Uh, and it kind of iterates in that way. It was a book that I think most scientists, all scientists should read. It, it helped formulate a lot of the way I think about kind of scientific shifts and the history of science. It even informs some of my investing uh, as well. I think that's one book that I think is probably under read in, in the space that I would, I would recommend. I hope you enjoyed that episode. You can find all my links by going to bigpicturemedicine.co.uk. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, then please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. And by the way, some of these episodes are now available in video format on Spotify and on YouTube. Thanks for listening.